Hello, and welcome to the ELECTS webinar on Introduction to LC Subject Headings. This session serves as the first in our two-part series on Library of Congress subject headings. I'm Erin Elzey, a member of the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Bobby Bothman from Minnesota State University, Mankato, where he is the Metadata and Emerging Technologies Librarian. Bobby catalogs books and e-resources, wrangles files of MARC records, and investigates new technologies. He is a member of OLAC and serves on the editorial board for CCQ. He holds an MLIS and an MS in Geography and English Technical Communication. He also teaches cataloging and classification as an adjunct instructor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Bobby brings much expertise to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have him with us today. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for Bobby, please type them into the question box on your screen. Bobby's slides are numbered, so if you are referring to a specific slide, please include the slide number in your question. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now, here is Bobby. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so welcome to Introduction to the Library of Congress Subject Headings. And there's my clicker. Um, so here I am on the bridge of the enterprise. Again, I'm a metadata and emerging technologies librarian. Um, Mankato is right down here. The Twin Cities, most people know, is located up here. So we're about a, a two-hour drive from there. And Okay, so uh, cover a couple of conventions before we get started. Uh, I use a couple of acronyms and whatnot throughout the slides to make it a little easier to write things. And free-floating subdivisions is something that is very difficult to say very quickly and also very difficult to type very quickly. So FFS is the nice, easy abbreviation. Uh, LC, most of us all know for Library of Congress, and LCSH for Library of Congress subject headings. The name authority file is often abbreviated as NAF, uh, short for subject heading is SH, and then the subject headings manual, SHM. So some tools that you will be interested in. The first one, the Library of Congress subject headings themselves. There are a number of ways to access these. They are no longer published in print, but the print files, per se, are published in, in PDF. And so you can get the, to them at that very first URL. So it contains the exact view that you would see as if you were looking in those old giant red books. Classification Web is a subscription service, and if you have access to this, then you are all set to go. If you don't and you do make use of LCSH and Library of Congress classification, then it might be worth investigating. It, it includes all of those tools together, so it's a, a very handy access. And it also includes the name authorities in there as well. Uh, the LC authorities, the third link here at authorities.loc.gov, has the majority of LCSH. It has the topical terms. It does not contain all of the free-floating subdivisions and a couple of other types of terms. So it's not the full set, but it's the majority. You will also want to make copious use of the Library of Congress Subject Headings Manual, SHM. And so this second major bullet here is where you get to that. This is the instruction manual, the instruction sheets for how LCSH is used. And finally, uh, Van der Broughton has this awesome book, Essential Library of Congress Subject Headings, 
that I highly recommend if you make use of LCSH. She covers all of the basics and gets into many different types of nitty-gritty aspects of constructing LCSH headings. So it is, uh, it's an excellent book to have in your library. So the learning outcomes today uh, are that you will be able to describe the principles behind the LCSH vocabulary, identify concepts for subject analysis using the 20% rule. We'll talk about what that is in a few minutes here, and construct some basic topical headings and structured headings. So a little bit of history. Uh, the LCSH as we know it today began in July 1898, and it was called Subject Headings Used in the Dictionary Catalogs of the Library of Congress. So that was that initial list that was created, that initial controlled vocabulary. A second edition came out in 1919, and then various other editions at the publication of the eighth edition in 1975, its title was changed to Library of Congress Subject Headings. So that's what we call it today. Um, you may or may not be surprised to know that there is really no underlying theory to LCSH itself. It was a vocabulary system designed to be used at the Library of Congress in-house and was never really meant to be uh, something that was created for used by other libraries outside the Library of Congress. Uh, mostly is controlled by the policy that is detailed in the subject headings manual, the SHM. So when you look at the SHM, one of the things that you will notice is that it gives you instructions on how to create subject headings. So that is prevalent, particularly in the beginning parts of it, but much of those instructions and many of the other instruction sheets also give you a lot of guidance about how to make use of different types of subject headings. So therein lies the, the power of the SHM. So some principles behind LCSH. Uh, basically, it has to do with Cutter, Charles Amney Cutter, uh, who's Rules for a dictionary catalog are something that almost all of us know and learn very early on in library school. Uh, and Cutter had these three objects to enable a person to find a book of which either the author title or subject is known to show what the library has by a given author on a given subject or in a given kind of literature, and to assist in the choice of a book as to its edition and as to its character. And so when we look at these objects, we can see that uh, the 1C, the, to enable a person to find a book of which the subject is known, and 2E, to show what a library has on a given subject. The LCSH vocabulary is a method for meeting those objectives. And then we have uh, in, under the means here for subject entry that cross-references and classed subject tables are used. So the cross-references are what we will use to direct the user to those preferred terms. So some terms, the terms themselves in the vocabulary come from Warrant. And Warrant has four different main themes here that come into play. The first is literary. Uh, the literary warrant is the justification for use of the term. The second is use itself, so we want to use common usage, the, the way that terms are known by people. Uh, structural is another aspect, and this is something that allows us to bridge or link terms in a hierarchy. So we will see how there are broader terms and narrower terms, and we will also see how there are related terms, and so this is where that structural aspect comes from. And then finally, there's also the, the cultural warrant. So uh, there's, um, there's much out there that has been written about the, the ethics and cultural warrant aspects of the LCSH vocabulary, uh, some different problems and such with it. And so 
those are fairly easily findable in the literature itself. The, um, the cultural context is something that is we just can't get away from because of language being cultural in and of itself. And we'll see some examples of that in a minute. Uh, the other main principle here besides warrant, the, the fact that terms need to exist in the literature before we can create a vocabulary term for them, is that they need to be unique. So uh, we can't have two different concepts using the exact same term because then we don't have that method for collocation. We don't have a way to show what the library has on a given subject. There we go. Okay. So a really good example that illustrates these is the the term illegal aliens. So many of you have probably heard a little bit about this uh, term and some of the um, work that has been done with this in ALA and at the ELEX level uh, mainly last year. And I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Uh, if we look at the term illegal aliens itself, and so in the little offset up there in the upper right, what we see is a book called The Illegal Mexican Alien Problem. And we can see it was published in 1971. And it uses the subject term illegal aliens, Illinois. And so this is, uh, this is something that we have in, in my library. This is the earliest instance I could find for literary warrants in my catalog. And the 1970s and 1980s, the literature of that time, is when we start to see the use of this term illegal aliens. And it was established in 1980 as the inverted style here, aliens, comma, illegal. And um, after a certain point in time, as the Library of Congress started to adjust many of these, it was put into direct order, illegal aliens. So that happened a little later. Uh, common use. <clears throat> The term aliens dates back to that very first edition in 1898. So aliens in the 19th century was the term used for people who were not citizens of a given country. And that's where that's coming from. So from a cultural use perspective, it made sense in the 19th century. And in the 1970s is when we start to find this being used in dictionaries and in media usage. And so the, the language is also used in US statutes. So this is where that common use is coming from. Structurally, when you look up uh, the term illegal aliens, you see that it is a bridge also for the broader term aliens and it has some related terms such as children of illegal aliens. So this is where we, we see this structure the structural components across various related terms. And finally, the cultural warrant. So beginning in the 2000s, the media began using the, the terminology undocumented immigrants in place of the term illegal aliens. And so <clears throat> this is where we see the cultural usage changing and we see that lag in um, the vocabulary itself. So last year, uh, about this time and last year, the Library of Congress posted this press release that uh, you should still be able to get to there, the Library of Congress to cancel the subject heading illegal aliens. So the proposal here is that the term aliens will be uh, changed to non-citizens and that the term illegal aliens will be um, made obsolete and instead replaced with two different terms, non-citizens and unauthorized immigration. And the idea behind this is that it takes the, uh, it, it labels the activity unauthorized immigration in a much clearer way. And so the, what has happened with this, however, is some um, political, political stuff. I'll just leave it at that. And at 
ALA Midwinter, the last I heard, the Library of Congress was supposed to make some sort of announcement by the end of January, and I still haven't seen or heard anything about this yet, so I don't know when this change really is going to happen, uh, but it should happen hopefully sometime this year uh, to, that we can see movement on this. So aliens will become a non-preferred term for non-citizens, which will now become the preferred term at some point in the near future. And then the term non-citizens will also uh, have a redirect from illegal aliens. Illegal aliens will redirect to both non-citizens and unauthorized immigration. Um, so, and then terms that use the concept alien will be revised accordingly. So, church work with aliens or children of illegal aliens, those will be adjusted as well. So that's what's in store for us for this concept in the in the future. Um, some composition of how LCSH topical terms are constructed. So first, there are one the one word terms, typically plural nouns. Mothers and jewelry are going to be good examples of this. So jewelry is one of those terms that we, we don't have a plural for. Uh, Two-word noun phrases or modified nouns are another type that we see. So the example we have here are single mothers and jewelry making. We also still see inverted headings. So inverted headings were much more common and in, in made a lot of sense and were very usable in the card catalog era. So in that subject card catalog, you could pull it out, go to J, look at jewelry, and you would see jewelry ancient, jewelry medieval, jewelry modern. Uh, so they would be filing together under that main concept of jewelry. Today, we, we don't construct this inverted heading very often, except under very particular circumstances. Um, so I think it is, it's, it's basically not used anymore. However, there are still headings out there that exist like that. Um, we have conjunctions and prepositional phrases that will come up. So two different concepts here, mothers and daughters, for some type of relationship between topics, uh, mothers of criminals, jewelry and literature. So you will see these types of constructions as well. To be able to differentiate two different concepts that use the same type of term, uh, you will see qualified headings. So, for example, the concept cold for meaning temperature is simply cold, but there's also the cold that we get in the winter, the common cold, and that is differentiated with, with this qualified heading disease to make it different. Um, cold dishes, cooking, so sometimes the qualification is added there as, a, as an element to clarify, like we see with cold dishes, as opposed to um, an effort to differentiate from a different topic. And then we can also use names for persons, families, corporate bodies, and geographic places. So we have some examples here of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, showman, showroom Logic, which is a, a corporate body, uh, a company, uh, Miami Beach, Florida, and Okeechobee Lake, Florida. So here we've got an example of what you see when you're looking at a vocabulary term in the LCS, LCSH vocabulary. And the display here is mainly what it looks like in the classification web, but is very similar to what you would see in the PDFs. And so on the left side is what you would see in the vocabulary, and then on the right side what we have are some bullet points to help explain what's going on on the left. So for the term decision making, if you actually go to LCSH and look that up, Everything you see here is what exists there, except for this scope note right here. I added that just to complete the whole picture here. So for any given term, it's 
not um, a given that you will see all of these different elements. You may see a scope note and that's it. You may see uh, the use for and the narrower terms and that's it. So uh, there's, a, there's a mixture of what you see here on the screen for any given term. And for many terms, you see absolutely nothing. You just see the, the term itself and that's it. So, um, so we'll go through this from top to bottom here. The main subject term is always in bold. So you will see that up top in bold. And then below that, we see some LC classification numbers here. So we've got um, three numbers and then the QA right here, this is a range uh, for different LC classification numbers that relate to mathematical statistics. So if there is some sort of close association between a topical term and LCSH and a classification number or classification range in the Library of Congress classification, then that will appear here beneath the heading itself. Then there may be a scope note um, for the, the vocabulary terms themselves. Some will have them, many do not. For the free floating subdivisions, when you look those up, they definitely will have the, um, a scope note in there. Almost all of them will. And it's really important to read those scope notes because take them at face value, they will tell you exactly how it may be used and how it may not be used. So that's a very important thing to look at and to consider. Below that, we've got UF, which stands for used for. So these are your cross references. So if you were, for example, to look up the term decision analysis, it would say use decision making. So all of these terms here are synonyms for decision making. So decision making is that unique term, the preferred term for this, these types of concepts. It has a broader term of choice psychology. So if you go to choice psychology, what you're going to see there is that choice psychology has a narrower term decision making. So this is that structural component. There's also a related term, problem solving. So some terms have relationships to other vocabulary terms where it's not a hierarchical, uh, narrower or broader term. And so it's something that is more parallel and that's where you get the related term. The SA that you see here is for complex see also references. Many times these see also references are directing you to a free floating subdivision. So in this case it's directing you to the subdivision decision making which can be used under names of individual corporate bodies and other topical headings. So again this is why it's really important to read these scope notes and such because they tell you exactly how it may be used. And then finally, we've got the NT right here, which means narrower term. So all of these terms right here are full-fledged vocabulary terms in LCSH in their own right, but hierarchically they are a narrower subset of this concept of decision making. So if you think about a, a Venn diagram where decision making is a big circle, then each of these concepts here is its own circle that is contained within, wholly within the big circle called decision making. And finally, uh, you may see in parentheses immediately following the subject term, either this construction may subdivide geographically or you might see not subdivide geographically or you may see nothing. So what this means is when you see may, that means that you can apply a free floating subdivision that is a geographic term. So geographic analysis can be added to this particular topical term. If it says not, then you cannot add any 
geographic term. So it's been determined that this is not something that can be subdivided into a geographic fashion. And if you see nothing, no determination has been made, and therefore it's the equivalent of not. So you would never add a geographical subdivision to a topical term that does not have this statement right here. So let's talk about content analysis. Subject headings are meant to summarize the overall content, that those most important topics of the resource that you are analyzing. And the Library of Congress has a practice to assign headings only when a topic represents 20%, at least 20% of the work. So if you have a book that is 100 pages long, then the topic needs to be discussed for at least 20 pages for it to get a subject heading. That's the easiest way to, to think about that. Um, that's not to say that a topic that takes less than 20 pages in that 100-page book can't get a subject heading. If it is significantly important, then by all means, you are welcome to do so. But as a general rule of practice, we like to follow this 20, what we call the 20% rule. So it needs to comprise at least 20% of the work to get a subject heading for it. Uh, subject heading should be appropriate to the treatment. So if you have a multi-volume set, like Biomes of the World, then your subject analysis to that for that set, if you're cataloging the set as a whole, should be appropriate to the set. If you are cataloging each volume individually, like deserts and oceans, then the subject analysis for the individual analytic record for each of those volumes should be specific and direct for deserts or oceans. So uh, that's what we mean by appropriate to the treatment. You can use as many subject headings as are necessary. So there's, there's no um, actual limit to these. Uh, generally speaking, we usually don't go more than six subject headings. Uh, LC practice is to do no more than 10. So the Library of Congress likes to have some strict um, guidelines on when to stop. And if you have a topic that is applies to more than one geographic area, to add that geographic location, you have to replicate that topical term one more time. So you can count those in your count as, um, as one topic. So, so you, would, you would not necessarily reach, you could have 10 or 12 subject headings in there in practice because you're covering three different geographic areas and you have to repeat that term three times each to apply the, the geographic free-floating subdivisions. Okay, so let's take some examples here and, and walk through them. Um, the first is to be aware of the title. So title proper, the titles proper tend to be things that are meant to be catchy. And so we see in this example, on fire, but it has nothing to do with fire, fires, or combustion. It has to do, as the other title information tells us, about the seven choices to ignite a radically inspired life. So often those subtitles give us a clearer indication of what the content is going to be about. And we can also, uh, you should also make use of the description on the back of the book. You should make use of the table of contents. Um, and if you can't get enough out of that, going into the introduction or preface to the book, if it has one, can often help to clarify what the, what the content is. It's always best to start with some keywords and just look at it from a broad perspective. And so this book, we can say, is talking about success and fulfillment and life choices. So if we take those keywords and start exploring the LCSH vocabulary, we're going to find that success is an LCSH vocabulary term. If we look up fulfillment, we're going to see that it tells us to use 
the concept, the term self-realization. And looking up life choices, this is one of those ones that is sort of difficult to, to find until you have run into it a few times and have some experience seeing it and you know that the, the concept is conduct of life. And so when you create that summary that you would put into a 520 field, the, or you have one on the record already, look at that because that is also going to give you, when you write it or when you read it, you're going to be able to pull out keywords that you're going to use to find these topical terms. And so we can see the bolded, successful business, high motivation, clarity, and purpose. So these are also terms that might be useful in applying your subject analysis. So the specificity of content analysis is something that is very important to keep in mind. Subject analysis is meant to be high level. It is not meant to index the book. The catalog is not an index. Um, you want to use the most specific subject heading possible. So a really good example that comes out of the Van de Broughton book is a book about bees. Um, you don't want to classify a book about bees with the concept of insects because people who are looking for bees won't find it and people who are looking for insects generally are going to get this book that is about one insect and it's not going to meet their needs. So specific as possible. Specific and direct is what you want to keep in your head. Again, uh, do not assign subtopics represented by a higher topic. So if we think back to decision making, it had some narrower terms. We would not assign one of those narrower terms unless one of those narrower terms is at least 20% of the, the subject analysis in general. We have a rule of three for subject analysis, so uh, you can assign two or three specific subject headings, but if the broader topic um, covers three of those, then you would go with the broader topic. And then there's a rule of four. <laughs> so with the rule of four, you can assign four of those narrower terms rather than the broader term because the broader term may be too broad to be meaningful, but four is the limit. So if you have five or six specific subject headings that are part of a broader topic, then you absolutely have to use the broader topic. So let's think about specificity a little bit and let's look at this book, How Not to Die, Discover the Food Scientifically Proven to Prevent and Reverse Disease. So from the table of contents, we can see that uh, everything here is about different types of diseases, heart disease, lung disease, brain disease, etc. So these are all diseases of, of the body. And if we start thinking about what those terms are, um, it's, not, it's not about each of these diseases individually, it's about diseases generally, and it's about nutrition, and it's a self-help book. So uh, we need to scope it up just a little bit because, because we can't put a subject heading for each of these different diseases here. And so if we look at this and remember that your first subject heading needs to be the predominant topic. So the predominant topic that you put in your record. Um, if you have a biography, then that first subject heading needs to be the subject heading, the access point for the person for whom the biography is about, and then you would follow that with a class of person heading. So as an example, uh, if you had a if you had a biography of um, Georgia O'Keeffe, then you're going to have O'Keeffe, you're going to have her, her access point in a 600 field for her name. And then immediately following that, you're going to have some term like artists 
or women artists, followed by the free floating subdivision biography. So that's how we do those for biographies. Um, for equally important topics, and this comes up a lot when there's no way to, to pick which one is more important, or when you have uh, interdisciplinary topics, then you, you still have to assign one as the predominant topic. So um, you, you assign one as the, as the first, you assign those as the first two subject headings. The one that goes first, you probably want to think about in terms of the classification system that you're using so that it ends up being with other resources on the shelf that would most likely benefit a serendipitous search. So that, that's what you want to think about, um, and, and that's how you might flip which one will be the first. The um, classification and shelf listing manual, CSM, has more about this in H80. So that's a, a reference there to the classification and shelf listing manual. So we'll come back to this in a minute, but um, about this is about food choices that may prevent non-communicable diseases. So um, we've got chronic diseases and nutrition. So these, it could be chronic diseases as our first subject heading, or we could flip that and have nutrition as our first subject heading. So think about this for a minute, and we'll revisit this slide toward the end. So let's talk briefly about types of terms. We have topical terms from LCSH. We have name terms that come from the name authority file, so they can also be used as subjects. We have name title and title headings uh, from the name authority file, so this is when you have a work as a subject. There are genre terms, and then we have free-floating subdivisions, and there are four types. We have topical, geographic, chronological, and form. Okay, um, our Mark 21 fields for bibliographic data for subject terms are all in the 6XX tag family. So we're going to use 600 for personal names, 650 for to topical terms, 651 for geographic, 655 for genre terms. So these are the ones that you're going to see most often. Um, Second indicator is going to be zero in any 6XX tag where you are following the Library of Congress subject headings, where you're either using them or you're following their principles. So even if you're using a name from the name authority file that's not actually coming out of LCSH, you are still applying the principles of use of LCSH, and that's why you code that as a zero. Your subfield A is going to be for that vocabulary term from LCSH. Subfield X is going to be for topical free-floating subdivisions. Z will be used for geographic, Y for chronological, and V for form free-floating subdivisions. So the basic order is going to be the topical term from the vocabulary, like ecology, and then you're going to have either a free-floating topical subdivision or a free-floating geographic subdivision. The way we tell how that works is that the geographic, when you can do it, the geographic free-floating subdivision follows the last term that allows for subdivision itself by geographic location. So when we look up ecology, we see that we may subdivide that geographically, and when we look up the free-floating subdivision study and teaching, we see that we may also subdivide that geographically. So these two have to follow each other, and then the, the, the geographic term follows that last one that allows it. Uh, if we look at this one down here for ecology, Minnesota, Boundary Waters Canoe Area, the topical free-floating subject term history does not allow for geographic subdivision, and therefore it must follow your geographic free-floating subdivisions. 
And so here are some examples of some topical free-floating subdivisions. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. These are ones that are fairly common that you're going to see over and over again in a lot of different books. Um, so one of the ones I want to point out that, that we might make use of in a few minutes here is nutritional aspects. So that's something we might be able to use soon. Um, I want to use this the financial regulation of U.S. banking and securities markets as a method to, um, to look at why scope notes matter. Um, the keywords here that we have are banks, security markets, and regulations. And the LCSH that we look up for these, we can see for banks, it tells us to use financial institutions. For securities markets, it tells us to use securities. But when we look up regulations, we find some difficulty here because the concept of regulations has more to do with um, rules. And so when we find this free-floating subdivision regulations, you might think, yay, this is perfectly what I need. But it's not true because the scope note says uses a topical subdivision under names of individual educational institutions and military services for works about regulations of those institutions or services. So we can't use regulations in this context of regulating banks and security markets. Uh, the, the, what we mean by financial regulation really is the concept of law and legislation. So these regulations that we find for financial institutions come from laws, and that's where, where uh, this law and legislation free-floating subdivision will be more appropriate. So I, I can't emphasize enough uh, reading those scope notes to see how you are allowed to use these terms, because many times I've run into some sort of free-floating subdivision that I've thought, oh, this is perfect but it has a very specific meaning that actually can't be used the way that I'm thinking about wanting to use it. Let's talk a little bit about chronology terms. <clears throat> so there are um, a set of chronology terms that you can use basically at will, and it's everything for the modern era. So the, the modern era uh, for cataloging purposes, for subject analysis purposes begins with the year 1501, so the 16th century. So you can use 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st century at will. Basically, these chronology subdivisions are always paired for when they're used with some sort of topical term. They're paired with the, the topical free-floating subdivision history. So you will see this type of construction, some topic, history, 19th century, for example. The exception to this type of construction, this type of pairing, is when you use it with art and art forms, with individual literatures and literary forms, and with musical compositions. So these types of, of concepts, you can use the, these century chronology terms to modify and to limit in time the coverage that is being addressed for those particular topics. You do not need the free-floating subdivision history unless it really is about the 20th century history of American art. And then, of course, you would. So if it's just about 20th century American art, then this is the construction that you will want. Now, there are lots, you will find lots of editorially prescribed chronology out there in the vocabulary list. And typically, they have to do with some sort of bloody event, like wars or revolutions, um, those types of things. Um, also, scandals. Um, or another one where he will see 
these uh, chronology terms. And often they will again be paired with this free-floating subdivision of history. But you will see either some sort of term like Civil War, comma, and then the date range, or just some sort of specific date range, or even an open-ended date range. And so these have been carefully selected and constructed by the editors of LCSH itself for very specific use. So you cannot, um, you cannot take this subfield Y 1969 hyphen and use it somewhere else because it fits your needs. It may only be used in this full construction of United States history 1969 dash. So that's something that's important to keep in mind. These things have to be used as is. Form subdivisions, these are terms that describe what the content is, not what it is about. So it's an isness type of thing, um, similar to what you might find in the genre form field of the 655. So if you have something that is art, then you're, you would have subfield V art at the end. Uh, common ones that we will see are biography, um, comic books, strips, etc. for particularly graphic novels. Guidebooks happen quite a lot in uh, when you're cataloging for geology and such. Uh, juvenile literature, juvenile fiction, so juvenile resources have several form free-floating subdivisions. Maps is another one, so things that are maps of a particular geographic region will have these form subdivisions. Popular works and textbooks are another um, good one to keep in mind for, for use on those. So coming back to our how not to die that I said, think about this and, and we'll come back to it. Again, we've got these two concepts to think about, uh, chronic diseases or nutrition, which is it, uh, which is the most about this particular book. So in this particular case, however, we have this handy dandy nutritional aspects free-floating subdivision. So that concept of nutrition, we can use basically like an adjective with chronic diseases. And a tip for you is that when you construct these strings of topical terms with free-floating subdivisions, if you read it backwards and it makes sense, then you usually have the construction right. So if you read this backward, we have nutritional aspects of chronic diseases. And that's what this is talking about. So we have a, a pretty good subject string here for this book. So yeah, you have to kind of add your own conjunctions or whatnot when you hit that, that subfield marker. But it's a really good uh, way of, of checking yourself to make sure that this string you have constructed is really uh, the way that you want it to be. And that concludes uh, our slides, and we are ready to do the Q&A session. All right, thank you, Bobby. That was a really great session. Um, as you said, now we're going to move on to questions. So audience, if you have not done so yet, please type your questions into the question box. And we do have a few that have been entered already, and they're primarily around what someone would do if they don't have access to classification web. Um, we had a question asking about slide 11, which was the LCSH vocabulary layout. How would one find that information if they don't have access to class web? Okay, so um, let's go back to the way beginning tools. So if you do not have classification web, the the subject headings themselves are up to date and freely available as PDF files. I don't recommend printing them because these are hundreds of pages. Um, so they're arranged by alphabet, so um, numbers, and then each PDF is a letter of the alphabet, and then there's one for numbers as well. Um, so if you go to this link, you'll be able to see them, and you can 
you can download the file that you need and take a take a look at that. Um, there should also be, I think there's an, there might be an index in there as well, but if you don't have Class Web, this is what you want to use. Again, the, um, the site authorities.loc.gov is freely available. It parallels catalog.loc.gov. So uh, going to authorities.loc.gov, you can search all of the LCSH vocabulary. It's just that it doesn't have some of the um, it doesn't have some of the free-floating subdivisions, is my understanding, and it doesn't have um, some of the. There's something else it doesn't have, and it slips my mind what that is. And then for slide 11, let's hold on a second and. 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, so this layout that you see here looks the same basically in Class Web as it does in those print PDF files. The only difference is that in Class Web, these narrower terms down here are hyperlinks, and the related term and broader term are hyperlinks. So you can click on them, and it will take you to that particular term and the um, LCC, if it's there, those are also hyperlinks and will take you into the, the classification system. All right, thank you. And then a related question is that if you're trying to search by keyword as you would in ClassWeb but don't have ClassWeb, which one of these tools would you suggest is the best one for doing that? The PDF, perhaps? If you don't have Class Web, um, then yeah, so the PDF is all OCR'd, um, the optical character recognition. So you can open it either in your browser or open it as a PDF um, in the native PDF viewer, and then use the find function to, to do some searches there. Uh, the same is the, so the, and then when you're searching in Class Web or authorities.loc.gov, there's there's a, a keyword search in both of those as well. So both of those online tools, the free one and the subscription service, have that as well. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is in regards to the form subfield. When you use a subfield V in a 650, would you also use the same term in a 655? Um, I think it depends. So they're they're doing two different functions. So um, the let's go down to where they are um, here. Okay. So again, if you think about uh, the reading it backward type of thing, then if you have um, if you have the the topic snow removal, and then you follow that up with bibliography, what you're saying is that it is a bibliography of snow removal. So the idea here is that when the researcher sees that particular subject heading and then they see bibliography following it, they know it's a, it's not a, a book about snow removal per se, rather it is a bi bibliography on that particular topic. So uh, these form subdivisions are meant to modify like an adjective does in, in grammar. They're meant to modify the main topic. The form and genre term that you would put in the 655, um, those are, are really good ways just to find that particular form. So yes, you can use the, the concept of bibliographies in a 655 field as well. Um, that's a, particularly when we are dealing with these faceted OPACs that we have now, that can be a really helpful way to allow people to get to that particular type of form. So there's nothing wrong with having it in both places. All right, thank you. Um, and one of our audience members says that they rarely see scope notes in classification web, and is there any reason that you know why? Um, I think because 
generally speaking, when a, when a vocabulary term is submitted, they want it to be basically self-evident and to um, don't read, I guess my advice always is don't read too much into the term when you look at it. So if there's no scope note, take it at face value and, and that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, that's, that we don't put too much definition back there. And so the ones that do have scope notes, that um, they have that in particular so that we don't use it in a way that causes things to be um, misinterpreted. So the scope note is, is, meant to, um, is meant to help advise where the whole vocabulary itself is meant to just kind of be used in an as-is basis. I hope that made sense. I think so. Um, and we have another one about the form subdivisions. There's mm -hmm. a question if she, if our um, audience member just wants to clarify that when they're using the form terms, it's what the item is, not the aboutness. So using a subfield V of poetry means the object is poetry. And then they wondered if there's a further way to break it down. So if they had poetry by women, is there a way you can use the subfield V for that? Yes, so correct, the um, subfield V, and you can use um, multiple terms, so you might have humorous poetry, so you could have subfield V humor, and then subfield V poetry, the order doesn't actually matter um, which comes first. The um, So that's telling you that the content is humorous, that it is poetry. The, if you have If you have poetry by women poets, then your topical term is going to be, your topical term will be women poets or something like that. Yeah, women poets. But um, if you add a subfield V onto that, then what you're saying is it's poetry about women poets. So um, if you're wanting to if I'm understanding this right, you're wanting to mark the the book of poetry as as poetry by a woman poet. Um, that's where you would need to use a 655 that means women poets. I think. Uh, got it. That's probably the best <laughs> way you. to do that because the 650 is what it's about. So it's not about women poets. You want something that's saying that it is by women poets. Yeah, the, I think 655 is the better way to do that. I'd have to um, I'd have to do it and think through it because part of me is something in the back of my head is saying there's something wrong with this and it's just not coming to me right now. Okay, thank you. Um, we are running out of time now, so we are going to have to wrap up the Q&A session. But thank you, Bobby. Um, and for the audience, Bobby has kindly offered to answer the remaining questions in writing. So any unanswered questions that were already submitted, those will be sent to our attendees via email after the webinar. Um, just a minute, we're changing slides again. All right, so we're so glad that you all could be with us today, and you will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions, as your comments are very valuable and help the ELECT Continuing Education Committee plan future events. The email will also include links to today's slides and recording, and as we said, the answers to the remaining questions. You also now have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. That information will also be in the email. Thank you to our presenter, Bobby Bothman. Thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Wanda Jazieri and I Ping Chingafi, and to Megan Doherty from the ELECT office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. We have five more webinars scheduled for this season, including the second part in this series on Library of Congress subject headings, which takes place on March 8th. See the ELECT's website to register or find more information on these webinars. And finally, ELECT also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you again all for joining us today, and this will conclude our session.